Begint, good to see you again. Um, imagine for a second that you hate yourself, that you have no self-esteem. Imagine that you deeply despise your parents and your grandparents and whatever they did in the past. Would it be like, like a solid foundation to look at the future? Not really. Huh? Well, now imagine that a country or a civilization does basically the same thing that it only looks at its past and legacy with content and only from a negative stand view. Well, question, do you have the impression this is what the West is doing right now? Do you have the impression that the West moved from pride to shame? Uh, we are known in the West as being the civilization of self-criticism, but didn't we push it too hard? to self-loathing, to this lack, deep lack of self-esteem. I mean, if you read the news, you have the impression that only whites can be racist, only whites can be oppressed, only whites had empire. I mean, this, historically speaking, is absolutely false. But still, this is what is happening. So this is what we're going to discuss today. And also another question is, did you think that this happened for the first time? Or actually, this is a pattern, historical pattern, you know, that goes through the, the Western civilizations. Did the West already hate it himself already in the past? I think this is another important question. To discuss that, Brainbar found an exceptional personality. Somebody who grew up between Sweden and the US and then studied and worked in the US, in France and Italy, among other countries. Now he's based in the US and he came here. He's going to speak for 20 minutes. 20 minutes maximum, because after that, it's also important that you have time to address your own questions and to ask him your own questions. So he's going to sit there in the hot seat and feel free to grill him with your own questions. But without further ado, let me welcome on stage the philosopher, the thinker, and the author of the Western self-content, Benedict Beckeld. So good afternoon, uh, very nice to be here and thank you for the introduction. So as you heard, the topic right now is Western self-contempt, cultural self-hatred. Um, to give a couple of examples so everybody sort of knows what it is that I'm talking about, there was a couple of years ago a Scandinavian airline commercial where they said that there is no such thing as Scandinavian culture. Everything that we love about Scandinavia actually comes from outside. Or it is when a Frenchman waves a French flag or a German waves a German flag and they are assumed to be fascists or even Nazis. It is in my own country, the United States, um, which is at least now what I call my home, have for a long time, uh, when people tear down statues of our founding fathers, thinking that this is in some way progress. That is cultural self-hate. To share one personal anecdote, um, many years ago, in an earlier lifetime, I was a volunteer teacher in sub-Saharan Africa, in Namibia, and when we were in orientation there, the American group leader of our group of volunteers said that living in a different culture had taught her that those who attacked us on September 11, 2001, had a point. And, of course, it's one thing to criticize certain aspects of one's own government's foreign policy. I do that myself all the time, especially with the current administration. But it's quite another thing to say that 3,000 people of your 3,000 fellow Americans and fellow New Yorkers, she was from New York City, 3,000 fellow Americans being killed, that, that's, that that was somehow justified. This is the phenomenon that we're talking about, cultural self-hate. Now, everybody knows or most people know about this phenomenon, they've heard of it before, they recognize the symptoms. But people generally don't understand why it actually happens. The idea of hating one's own culture seems so foreign to the normal state of affairs that it seems to be something absurd, something completely new that is difficult to explain. And in fact, it can be explained. 
a lot of people have written about this in the past. They've written uh, screeds against cultural self-contempt. They've written about how maybe it's because of cultural Marxism or maybe because of the Frankfurt School in the, previous, in the early part of the previous century. These are all parts of the explanation. But in order to truly understand Western self-hatred, Western self-contempt, we have to use the philosophy of history. I'm a philosopher by, by trade, by profession. And the philosophy of history is a bit of a neglected sub-discipline of philosophy. But the branch of philosophy that studies history, that tries to understand why, not what happened, that's the job of the historian, but why things happen, and if there are certain patterns that can be perceived. And so if we approach this problem through the philosophy of history and actually try to understand why this happens, then we can see that, in fact, it's not something new. And as the saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun. We discover that, in fact, this is a phenomenon that has happened in the West ever since ancient Greece. Now, the details are sometimes a little different. Um, the physical details won't always be exactly the same, but if we, take, if we step back and take a broad, a broad bird's eye view of the phenomenon, then we see that, in fact, the larger pattern always repeats itself. And the book that was mentioned earlier, Western Self-Contempt, uh, my book that was published um, a while ago, is the book that tries to actually explain precisely why this happens. Although I am, of course, against uh, cultural self-contempt, the goal isn't to attack it, because in order to understand something, we have to respect it enough to take it seriously and see why it actually happens. And so what I'm going to do is to give you a bit of a glimpse of why it actually happens, to explain the process of how it works, and that will enable us to understand why this is going on today. Um, so first of all, in terms of definition, there is a word for this uh, kind of cultural self-hate, and that word is oikophobia. Oikophobia, the word itself, was coined by the late British philosopher Roger Scruton uh, in the 1990s. Uh, most people know the phenomenon of, phenomenon of xenophobia. So xenophobia is the fear or the hatred of foreigners. Oikophobia, from the Greek oikos, is the fear or hatred of home, of one's own cultural home, of one's own society. And once we have a term for this phenomenon, it actually becomes easier to discuss it. Um, and so, essentially, the first thing to understand about orcophobia, about cultural self-hate, is, as I mentioned, that it is repetitive. So there are a couple of conditions, a couple of circumstances that need to be in place for cultural self-hate to arise. Um, and this is also, by the way, why this is mostly a Western phenomenon. Sometimes I'm asked, is orcophobia, is cultural self-hate uniquely Western? The answer is, it's not exclusively Western. We do find it outside of the West. But it is mostly Western because the conditions, the circumstances that are required for orcophobia to occur are more Western. So to go through, again, a bird's eye view of how this happens, early on, in the early days of a society, that society is a Western society now that we're talking about. Western society in the early days is um, it's parochial, it's hierarchical, it's patriarchal. Um, in a word, it is very conservative. Now, what happens is that the society, that particular civilization, is able to be successful. It defeats outside enemies. I mentioned that it started in ancient Greece, so the outside enemy for the Greeks were the Persians. It defeats outside enemies and it is able to establish a certain sense of security, a sense that we're not being threatened by outside enemies. They are able to establish security, safety, wealth, all of these things that are a product of the success of a civilization. Once that happens, the attention of intellectuals is able to turn away from the enemy when the Persians are invading, and the same thing for, for later societies in the West, we don't have time to look at ourselves. We have to focus on the external enemy. But once that enemy has been defeated and the society has grown very successful and there is an open intellectual space where intellectuals can come together and exchange ideas, once that happens, that is when the scene is set for cultural self-hate. And this is also why it is mostly, again, like I said, not exclusively, but mostly a Western phenomenon, because uh, these things, an open intellectual space, a certain sense of egalitarianism, where different people feel that they have a voice and can add to the conversation, those things have been more typically, to, have been more typically found in the West than in the non-West, which is why, again, it is cultural self-hate is 
mostly a Western phenomenon. And so what essentially happens is that in the early days of a civilization, the society is one tribe. We can think of it as one tribe. But as it grows successful and larger, there are smaller interest groups that develop within the tribe. And so a kind of neo-tribalism develops where different groups of the society begin to compete against each other. And they start to view each other as greater threats than they view the external enemy, because the external enemy has been defeated. They're no longer relevant. And there's a great line in Freud that I like to quote uh, in the uh, Civilization and its Discontents. The German title is uh, Das Unbehagen in der Kultur. He has a phrase uh, which is very useful. It's the Nazismus der kleinen Differenzen, uh, the narcissism of small differences. And the point there is that if I think, if I, a Westerner, think of a nomad in Mongolia, for example, there's no reason for me to hate a nomad in Mongolia because he's so different from me. We have nothing to do with each other. So he's not a threat to me in any way. It's the person who lives down the street, my neighbor, he is the one against whom I measure myself because he's the one who can be a rival, an enemy of some kind. When we don't have existential threats to our civilization anymore, it's our neighbors who become the bigger threat. And this might sound like a bit of a cynical view of human nature. Obviously, human nature is capable of great good as well. But we do generally, some people more than others, but we do generally have a need to identify ourselves by measuring ourselves against something external. And when, in the early part of a civilization, that external thing against which we uh, measure ourselves is the enemy. Later on, once we have wealth and security and so on, the person or persons against whom we measure ourselves are our neighbors. And so we are able to raise ourselves up by pushing down the rest of our society. This is basically how orcophobia happens. And it's important to understand that because it is tied to human nature in this way, it happens repeatedly in history. Because while physical details are different from civilization to civilization, human nature, as already the great Greek historian Thucydides knew, human nature is always the same. It was the same 2,500 years ago. When he lived, it will be the same 1,000 years from now. And because human nature is a stable uh, factor through history, it stands to reason that cultural self-hate is not some new, absurd phenomenon. It is something that we can understand very well by looking at the philosophical, historical, and cultural anthropological development of self-hate in history. And so self-hate basically occurs shortly after a civilization has reached its peak. So I mentioned Athens. So for Athens, that's about late 5th century BC, early 4th century BC. Um, the peak arrives, by peak I mean basically civilizations, um, the height of a civilization's uh, ability to project violence, to project outward force. And for Athens, that is in the mid 5th century, and so Okophobia comes a little later, late 5th century, early 4th century BC. For Rome, we see it in Rome as well. Again, there are differences in the details when one looks at the various historians and philosophers and so on who express orcophobia, who express cultural self-hate, but the larger pattern is there. So when we look at the Romans, orcophobia sets in sort of in the la late uh, last third of the first century AD, early second century AD. If we look at France, uh, it sets in in the mid 18th century. Um, so the peak of French power Excepting Napoleon, which is kind of a late flourish, but basically the peak of French power is under Louis XIV. Okophobia comes under Louis XV. 1750s, 1760s, so basically in a tandem with the rise of the Enlightenment in France. In the United Kingdom, in England, it comes in the late Victorian era, 1880s, 1890s, around there. And in my own country, the United States, it comes in the 1960s we achieve basically the peak of our power after World War II, and okophobia comes in the 1860s. There are certain signs of it earlier, but basically, as a mass phenomenon, it comes in the uh, 1960s, and everybody knows what happened in the 1960s with the student rebellions uh, about the Vietnam War and everything like that. Um, and so once we understand this development, we finally become ready to, um, to face it and to tackle it. And so it's important to understand, uh, to understand it well enough to take it seriously. Um, and what's also important is, and this might sound a little fatalistic, but it's not meant that way, but basically because 
success is necessary for okophobia to arise, as I explained, the civilization has to be successful, success ironically leads to self-hate, right? This is the internal contradiction of cultural self-hate, namely that the civilization has to be successful before it starts hating itself. If it's not successful in this way, it's not going to start hating itself. Um, and I'll give you one quick example just to kind of illustrate it. There are many, many examples in history, but if we take the Roman Empire, Roman Empire is a convenient example because it has a very long history, so we can always kind of trace quite clearly what happens. It's reasonably well documented. Um, citizenship is expanded step by step in the Roman Empire. Already Julius Caesar expands citizenship to some extent, but then later on in the later empire, it continues to be expanded. Um, under the, um, in the second, in the third century, uh, and also under Caracalla, it's expand, it's, um, the citizenship is extended to all citizens or to all freeborn men of the realm. And so that might be considered a good thing because more people come to be included in the state and so they feel that they have something to gain by supporting the state, to fight for the state, because they feel that they're a part of it. They're a part of Rome, Rome is a part of them. So we see that that's a positive thing. But on the other hand, it also means that because everybody becomes a citizen, there is a greater multiplicity of different voices. There's a, different, there's a greater space for people to voice their opinions, for different groups, splintering comp comp competing groups to develop and to fight each other, and to consider each other as greater a threat than they do, again, external enemies. And so we see that it's the very same process that leads to advancement for the civilization and to success for the civilization that also leads to decadence and to cultural self-hate. And so for this reason, the rise of orcophobia, the rise of cultural self-hate, is just as natural, quote-unquote natural, doesn't mean that it's good, but it's just as natural as a civilization's rise. And only if we begin to understand why this happens will we be ready to tackle it. Now, there's obviously nothing wrong with trying to learn from other societies, from other civilizations, and to take an interest in other civilizations. But too often, it happens that this interest leads to a great love for other civilizations at the expense of our own. There is a balancing act where you can learn from other societies while still being appreciative of your own heritage. But too often people are drawn either in one extreme or in the other. And so only when we take okophobia seriously, when we understand how it works and why it happens, are we able to come to terms with it and to achieve that balancing act between learning from other societies, which is perfectly legitimate, but also appreciating our own heritage, uh, which, which one sees that's a balancing act that fails time and again. One final point I want to make about the um, rise of okophobia is that the first sign of okophobia coming around is the attack on religion. This is true in Greece, in, uh, in Rome, in France, in England, and in the United States and other Western countries. When religion, and, and the reason for that is that religion is the foundation of every society. There's no exception to that rule um, in the West or the non-West. So the first attack on the own religion is always the beginning of okophobia. Um, and it then leads, because, an attack on, because religion is so foundational for societies, an attack on religion leads to attack on everything else that the society has in con that, that, that that society uh, displays, that that society, all the other features that that society has. And we know that this happens. There are some public intellectuals today, I'm not going to mention any names, uh, but uh, there are some excellent public intellectuals, but a lot of public intellectuals have stated that we're experiencing mass atheism for the first time in Western history. This is not true at all. Already Plato, in Book 8 of the Republic, complains about mass atheism in Athens in the early 4th century BC. And there were many other examples of mass atheism occurring, maybe not quite as extreme uh, a form as today, but it happens repeatedly in history. And so when we understand that mass atheism has happened before, and we only have to read the philosophers, the historians, we only have to read the sources to know this, and put it all together, and see how they all connect. Once we understand this, we don't necessarily have to be religious, but we do have to have an appreciation for the tradition that come, comes with religion. Uh, because a civilization stands and falls with its god or with its gods. Uh, and we see this again, time and again, people, Roman historians complain that people no longer believe in the Roman gods, 
um, Tacitus and Suetonius are two good examples. Uh, Plato and Isocrates complain that people no longer believe in the Greek gods, and again, it repeats itself over and over again. So the final point I want to leave you with is that by understanding ochophobia, by respecting the phenomenon enough to really look at it seriously and see how it happens, only then will we be able to combat it, only then will we understand what is required for us in order for us to start loving ourselves again as a society. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Benedict. A lot of controversial points, so without further ado, please have a seat. Yes. Please grab the mic. It's your turn now. I'm sure that you know, this very thought-provoking uh, intervention uh, indeed like enlighten you. If you agree or you disagree, if you, uh, again, there's no cancel culture here. You can say whatever you like. Please go ahead. Who's going to break the ice? Who's going to be first? Sir? Uh, Thanks, Benedict. That was wonderful. So imagine uh, you are advising a president or a prime minister of a civilization that has hit the peak, and now this guy comes to you and he's like, you know, I don't want my society to start hating itself. What should I do? What are the one, two, three things I should do? So obviously in a Western country or in a, in a democratic country, there are limits to what a prime minister or president can do with his power. But what I would advise such a person uh, is to, first of all, encourage religious institutions and to encourage large families especially because what often happens, even people who, feel, who tend to feel rebellious toward their culture, once they have children, it doesn't always happen, but once they have children, very often a sense develops that they want to pass down something to their children. So having large families does help a lot. People do tend to become more aware of their own heritage, of their own tradition once they have children. So enacting policies that, encourages, that encourage large families uh, would be one of the first things uh, that I would advise them to do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Next question, sir. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask if you have seen any pattern which is uh, to technology, if it's, if it's um, you know, gaining more speed to this process or yes. what? Yeah, so that's an interesting question as well. I talk about that in greater detail in the book uh, that we mentioned. Um, basically, technology and again, I'm not a Luddite, I'm not against it. Technological development is a good thing, but technological development also leads to uprootedness. Uh, so it speeds up the process. And, and again, one can go back um, to, uh, to antiquity to find the same pattern. Again, physical details are going to be different, but for example, uh, the Athenians accomplished great innovations in trireme technology, uh, which allowed them, which basically opened up the Eastern Mediterranean for them so that they were able to import new ideas uh, at a much greater rate than they otherwise would have been able to do through trade and, and so on. And again, that's a good thing, but it also does lead to greater exposure to, um, to a love of other civilizations that can become dangerous for the own civilization. And obviously today um, we, we see, a, obviously not trireme technology, but the same pattern of um, of, uh, of the internet leading to much greater connectivity across the world, which again is a wonderful thing for somebody who, for example, is a researcher like me and for many other types of people. Uh, but yes, but it does lead to up uprootedness. It does lead to this jet-setting class of people who identify with cities and not with nations. Right, they ident like I, I gave a talk in Paris last week or I, I, now I'm flying into New York to... Uh, to, um, to, uh, to sell my book or whatever it is, and there, it leads to uprootedness uh, among a certain class uh, of people, among a certain intellectual elite. And that is also, again, also a repetitive pattern. The, the um, uh, scientific pursuit and intellectual pursuit is often collaborative, and that requires a flow across borders, which is a good thing, but again, that does speed up the loss of one's own national identity. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, sir, thank you. We also take questions from the right-hand <laughs> side of the, of the room. Uh, thank you. I have two questions. One question is, um, you talk about the religion, the ochophobia. How do you lead now with the Western European countries, who has now two religions mainly in Europe, how they can lead with this situation? And the second question, I'm from Argentina, but 100% Hungarian blood, but we have a, a different situation. In South America, we have the, a situation that we have the ochophobia due to the 
economic situation. How do you lead with that? Not to the religion point of view, you know, of the, the economic point of view. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so in terms of the two religions of Western and Northern Europe, yeah. So what happens there is that because, um, because Western Europe is self-hating, they've become relativists. They no longer consider their own truths to be absolute, whereas many of the Islamic immigrants are not relativists. They consider their truths to be absolute. And so when relativism and absolutism meet, relativism, of course, will always lose because they are the ones who are willing to compromise. The absolutists are not willing to compromise. And so in order for the West Europeans to find a way out of that conundrum, they basically have to start believing in their own truths again. And with orcophobia, that's going to be very difficult. Now, there is, of course, a backlash that one sees um, uh, brewing against uh, excessive Islamic immigration. Um, there, it's a little different from country to country. Some, you know, some countries have, have uh, gone farther down that route than others. Uh, but uh, essentially, um, starting to believe in one's own truths again, uh, ceasing to be relativist uh, is, uh, is important, is a part of that. When it comes to economic ecophobia, I'm not sure, I'm not entirely sure if I um, understood what you meant. Uh, in, in Argentina, you meant to say people are ecophobes because the, uh, because the economy is bad. Right. Yeah, so um, that's actually, that's interesting because the thing is, it's the wealthier countries that tend to be the most ecophobic, which goes back to this other question about technological development, because if a country is very successful, that gives more mobility and more exposure to foreign ideas. So actually, bad economy uh, is not necessarily something that necessitates ochophobia, because generally speaking, the more advanced, if you compare Germany, for example, with Italy, there's definitely more ochophobia in Germany than in Italy, um, and it's a wealthier country, and one sees that correlation over and over again. I'm not an expert on, on, on Argentina, so I can't say, uh, I can't answer that with certainty, uh, but what does happen to, what does tend to be the case is that, um, economic advancement, if anything, tends to act as a fuel for orcophobia because it also allows competing interest groups to become more powerful vis-a-vis -vis each other. Um, and so again, that's the double-edged sword of something positive mm -hmm. also having this negative side. Thank you very much for the question. Muchísimas gracias. We are done. Unfortunately, we are running out of time, but you had time also to address quite a few questions. Uh, again, a thrilling very, very challenging, uh, intellectually speaking, uh, in, in discussion. I think we are also going to come back home with a lot of, uh, of thoughts to chew on today. So uh, don't leave us. Please don't leave us. Stay. Next um, debate is uh, on climate, basically, whether it's too late to meet the goals of climate agreements. Who knows? Maybe the green climate is the third religion in this continent. We don't know. But anyway, we'll continue after the short debate. But before we end up this session. Please, a strong round of applause for Benedict Beckley. It was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.